Hey guys, Gaia Gaius here. Uh, just so you know, uh, I uh, I seem to have improved my uh, my audio situation. We have a, a new microphone that we're borrowing for the time being, uh, and it's uh, right now it's turning out to be a wonderful addition. And I uh, I hope you like the improvement to uh, the uh, the sound quality of my uh, videos from now on. At least uh, at least it's like I can actually get my own version of this mic. Anyways, back at it with another breakdown video. Uh, this time we'll be covering part three of the plot breakdown I've created, an episode review series on the Gaia Gear radio drama from 1992. For those who haven't seen my uh, first video in my uh, series, I'll have a link down in the description, as I will try to recap events briefly, but nonetheless we'll be going forward with the story once again. This whole video is spoilers, so if you haven't experienced Gaia Gear, or you haven't seen my first video in my series, go and check that out. And for now... We are back to the video. For a brief introduction, Gaia Gear, for those who haven't uh, seen my first video, is a series of five novels written by Yoshiyuki Tomino that were one of his original concepts for a sequel to his much more famous animated work, that being the original Mobile Suit Gundam. The story is set in the year UC203, over 110 years since Char's counterattack, 100 years since Gundam Hathaway, the recent addition to the film lineup. Uh, and these two entries are actually the two most important pieces of material to experience before going into the story, as the plot contains direct elements and continues many of the loosely hanging plot threads from these two entries. And for a recap of the last three episodes, we got hit with some really fascinating as well as some sad stuff. Afaranchi learned about the reasons behind his creation, and was forced to say goodbye to Everly, his fiance, But not before having an awesome mecha fight between him and four other man-machines, with Avaranchi gaining a better understanding of his own life and with a newfound purpose to see his planet protected and his lover in the form of Everly protected as well. He finally leaves the Earth on his new voyage to the colonies, where he is going to meet with the other forces of the Metatron Resistance. Now, for an update as to those who haven't seen my previous video, uh, I will be changing the pace of which I will be covering uh, this audio drama. Uh, originally, I had it uh, planned to cover three episodes of the audio drama at a time, but unfortunately, due to constraints and uh, software uh, limitations I have, um, I will unfortunately have to cut back on the amount that I cover in each video. So for now, we're actually going to be dialing it back and covering two episodes at a time instead of the original three episode plan I've had. Anyways, that's it for that little part. Let's get on with the rest of the video. Anyways, that's it for my little preamble. Let's go ahead and dive back into the story with episodes seven and eight. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. So... We begin Episode 7 in space. It's been eight hours since our heroes left the Earth, and it seems the crew are starting to get a little bit antsy. They followed the Metatron's coordinates they were given, but haven't seen anyone who's been there to meet them. As the captain tells them to keep waiting, Afarachi enters the bridge. The captain asks how he's been feeling, and the young man says that he's feeling better, but unfortunately, that being around in this weightless environment this long is still not sitting well with him. He feels sick with every step, but luckily the captain informs him that once they meet up with the others, he'll be able to rest. When Afarachi asks how the captain and his men can put up with the feeling of weightlessness, feeling that it somehow feels impossible that humans were able to leave the Earth in the first place, the captain reassures him that their trip should only be three more days, and then by then he'll get used to it. Once Afaranchi manages to steady himself, the group receives a clearance code from their allies, the Resistance's main battleship, the Mother Metatron. It has arrived to meet them, and the crew of the shuttle begin to make the procedures for docking the, with the cruiser. With the Man Machine's escorts patrolling by as they begin to dock, Afaranchi and Krishna get to watch as the ships connect, Afaranchi being amazed by the sheer enormity of the cruiser's size. Krishna explains that the Mother Metatron is their main mobile base. It houses over 30 other manned machines, and that this ship is just one in their fleet. As the ship completes its docking procedures, the captain tells Krishna to keep Afaranchi close to her, and that he needs to be careful when crossing the docking corridor. Krishna obliges, and teaches Afaranchi how to use the wall grips while in the ship. At first he's freaked out by it, but nonetheless gets used to how it works. 
Once the crew reach the other side, they are met by an old man who's here to greet them. This is Azaria Parrish. He's an admiral within the Metatron fleet, and he and the man next to him quickly berate the captain for calling Afaranchi not by his title, even though Afaranchi refuses to go by the term of Your Excellency. When Krishna herself offers a tour of the ship and calls him by his first name, the Admiral yells at her, as well as tells her that he needs to be called His Excellency rather than Afarachi. The man silencing her and appointing his own right-hand man as Afarachi's guide. The officer introduces himself as Glenn Cole Dill, and the man offers to show Afarachi the tour of the ship, with the Admiral leaving the team off to their own devices and forcing Afarachi to be left alone with the Admiral and his crew. Throughout the tour of the ship, Azaria himself points out the tiny details of the ship, making note of every single one and explaining it in great detail that the ship has been made to the standards that Shar Aznabal himself would have wanted. The crew of the ship cheer his arrival, but throughout this entire tour, Afarachi can feel nothing but a sense of unease. He asks why they're accepting him as their leader so quickly, but the Admiral touts Afarachi's recent victories, saying with the fact he's been able to control the Gaia gear so well, they have no doubt he's Shar Aznable reborn. That Afarachi is no doubt a new type, as the reports suggest. Afarachi then asks the Admiral how long he's been fighting for Metatron, with the man stating that he's been a part of their ranks for nearly ten years. The Admiral says he was once with the Federation forces and that he couldn't stand the corruption and left to join Metatron. Afarachi then says that he's been told about the recent losses that the Metatron forces have had over the recent weeks, and Parrish tells him that everything is okay and that it's just a result of the Manhunter's influence increasing as they expand their territory amongst the colonies. It is here that Afarachi is told about B. John Dargal and that he's currently the one leading the Manhunter forces in space, as well as spearheading the Division's efforts to take over the colonies. Afarachi then understands that the reason for the Manhunter's attack in the colonies is not because of Metatron, and Azaria concurs and adds that the Manhunters are nothing more than thugs, and that they've been planning on a way to stop them once and for all. This is where he shows him the Mother Metatron's massive man-machine hangar, showing off that all of this was made just for him, so that Shar Aznable would return and lead the Spacenoid independence movement when he returned. Now that they have Afarachi, they've got all the pieces they need to take the fight to the Manhunters. The scene ends with Afarachi wondering what kind of man Bijan really is, and then worrying if he's anything like Yurian. Okay, I need to pause everything after this. <sighs> Deep breaths. Now that we've been introduced to Admiral Parrish, I can talk more about Metatron as an organization. Now, these guys, I feel, are a major departure from the Space Noid independence movements like the Xeon, Ayug, or Mafti. The Xeon are zealous about their beliefs, the Ayug are genuine heroes who were slowly killed off, and Mafti is a generation of young people who sought change but didn't have the right plan to achieve it. The forces within Metatron, on the other hand, are a slight variation on that. They're just simply delusional. These people have all become so obsessed with their predecessors and forebears that they've lost sight of what they're doing. Afaranchi is a clone of Shar, that's a fact, but he's nowhere near possessing the level of brutality that Shar Aznable himself had, these guys are going to ask him to be just like Shar, or else they're gonna die on their hills, longing for a leader that they never knew or met, and it shows that these people truly just want a literal messiah, and unfortunately, if you know how this story goes, He'll try his best to meet their expectations, but he isn't going to be exactly what they want. And I think that's a really powerful concept in this story, that the UC timeline is dying and everyone is asking for a savior, and when they think they have one, they don't realize that he's just human like everyone else. This results in some very bad outcomes down the line, and it's what I think makes this story so interesting and overall tragic as a whole. Anyways, we cut to the next scene, and we are once again brought to Hellas on side two. It seems Ulurian has finally managed to return to space. 
he's met with Captain Darkle, and he's relayed him all of the information about Afarachi that he's managed to obtain while during his two failed attempts to capture him and his allies. Darkle throughout the discussion is very interested in Afarachi rather than Yurian's own failure. The two discuss their theories about him and why Metatron created him to begin with. Dargle, however, is ratified in his opinion that Avaranchi is no doubt a great threat to their plans. He then directs Yurian to the view of his new office, and within one of the colony's newly repurposed buildings that they managed to capture from the Metatron forces when they had taken over the colony. That the beautiful view is something that even strikes Yurian as awe-inspiring. They have a complete central view of the entire colony. Dargle, however, is not appealed by this view, as it's still from the perspective of inside of the colony, that he finds the artificial environment of a colony to be just that, artificial. The entire colony is nothing but a greenhouse, and all of the life that has taken root here is indeed beautiful, but lacks any strength compared to their Earthborn counterparts. He refers this back to even the colonists. Yurian then asks if Dargle thinks that, that, that might be the reason why Afaranchi was raised on Earth. Dargle affirms this, coming to the conclusion that mirrors Miranda Howe's own view on Afaranchi, that by raising him on Earth, he may be able to stamp out the flaws of his progenitor and breathe new life into the independence movement, but ultimately believes that it's not sensible, as by doing so, you create a clone of Shar that has little to no way of relating to the cause he's fighting for. Yurian ultimately apologizes for failing to prevent Afarachi's escape, but Dargle tells him to treat this only as a hindrance and asks what he wants to do next. Should he ignore him or go around him? Yurian, however, picks a third option, that he's going to do what the Manhunters do and defeat Afarachi, going straight through him. Dargle makes note that the Manhunter Way does not stand for incompetence, which Yurian agrees. He will find a way to make up for his failures. With this, Dargle gives Yurian his new orders. He's reassigning him to a new unit, the 8th Brom Texter Company. Yurian at first is a little confused. It was his original unit, and he is unsure of the benefits of this reassignment, as it has been quite some time since he's piloted a man machine before. But Dargle says that it's something he's going to have to get used to for the time being, as Metatron activity is currently on the rise, and he's going to need him to be ready to sortie at any moment now. When Yurian accepts these orders, the two are soon met by Lieutenant Marissa. It seems the Federation's third fleet at Side 4 has managed to acquire intel that the shuttle that the Metatron forces used to escape Hong Kong has managed to regroup with the Metatron fleet. Dargle himself now seems interested in all this. Wondering now that the Metatron have their Shar clone, he wonders how this is going to pan out, and he wonders if the Shar clone has what it takes to make it in space. After this scene ends, we cut to a short while later in a Manhunter man-machine hangar, where we're introduced to a new character, a man-machine pilot by the name of Lila Saber. The mechanic asking her how she feels about the Brom texture she's testing out. She herself finds the unit to be very unresponsive and criticizes the technician for his attempts at correcting the Brom texture's problems. It is here that Yurian makes his presence known, telling her not to be so hard on the mechanics as they're simply doing their best. When Lila meets him, she's amazed he's returned to their unit, with Yurian explaining that he's returned to their unit and that Dargle gave him a reassignment in order to punish him. Lila herself, though, makes a joke about it, saying that because of Yurian's failure, it seems he's now her subordinate. But Yurian interjects and states that they both hold the same rank, and that he's simply her colleague, and that he's glad to be working with her again. Later, the two have a chat in the mess hall, with Lila lamenting the unfortunate defeat of Zhang. She asks Yurian if the rumors are true and that the enemy who bested him was a new type. But Yurian says no, stating that Zhang simply thought he was going up against an inexperienced pilot and underestimated his opponent. When Lila pokes fun at the rumor that the one who bested him was a clone of Shar, Yurian says that that intel is top secret and he cannot comment on that. 
Lila backs off and says that if she's given the chance to fight this shark clone, she thinks it'll be fun to have a chance at playing around with him. Yuri laughs and says to go for it. He's free game and she can do whatever she likes. We then cut back to the Mother Metatron, with Afaranchi admiring the view of the distant Earth. He's amazed by the beauty of it and wonders if Everly is okay. Wondering if she's still in Hong Kong or has even managed to make it back home to the island. He wonders if, with this emerging new type power of his, that if Everly can hear his voice from so far away. He continues to watch the Earth before Krishna comes to greet him, who giggles when she asks if he's been thinking about Everly while staring down at the planet this whole time. Afaranchi admits it, and Krishna says that it's a good thing for him to be thinking of, as she knew she had a feeling he wouldn't be the kind of person to abandon her and forget about her all at once when he left for space. Afaranchi himself wonders what Shar Aznable would do in this situation, and asks if there was anyone in his life that he cared about. Krishna says, yes, actually. Her name was Lala Soon, and she herself was another new type like Shar. When Afaranchi hears this, he suddenly realizes that the sound of the name seems somewhat nostalgic to him, even though he's never heard of it till now. He asks if Shar was close with her, but Krishna's tone, however, dies down after he asks, stating that Lala was killed right before Shar's eyes in battle, these words causing Afaranchi to gulp the realization sending a sharp shiver down his spine. Trying to shrug it off, he asks how it is that Krishna knows so much about Shar, and she says that she's been a fan of his since she was little, that she's seen every historical recording of the man and has been obsessed with him her whole life. When Afaranchi tries to poke fun at this, Krishna tells him that her only concern now, though, is just Afaranchi, that it is her only job while working for Metatron, almost like a therapist. The two are soon met by Captain Madra, who informs Afaranchi that thanks to Afaranchi's own commands, that he and the others remain as his current team, much to the dismay of the other Metatron leaders. He then shows Afaranchi to his quarters and explains that Mother Metatron is designed to simulate artificial gravity through its gyros, a simple question that Afaranchi has as this is still his first time being in space, something that he still hasn't fully gotten used to. When Madra shows Afaranchi his own room, Afaranchi asks if he's really capable of acting as Metatron's leader. The Admiral and the others hail and praise him, but this is the first time he's ever been in space. And even though he possesses the memories of Shar, he asks if Metatron can even count on him. The captain encourages him, stating that from all the things that they've seen him do, that he definitely can do it. Krishna agrees, but Afaranchi has his doubts that because he's now being set up to lead the entirety of Metatron, he doesn't feel like it's a position he's truly capable of performing. The guy hasn't even been to space for that long. Now they're asking him to lead them. How can he lead them if he doesn't even know what he's supposed to be leading them to? The captain asks what Afaranchi wants to do. Afaranchi says that he wants to learn and know how the people of space live in comparison to Earth. He says he wants to go and see a space colony. After this request, we cut back to several moments later, the Admiral and the Mother Metatron's crew are scrambling to find Afaranchi and the others. It seems the Spacius has launched once again, with the crew leaving without permission. The Admiral fuming as he's given the notification from his crew. Kellen laughs at the thought of Parrish freaking out, with Joe worried about where they're heading to. It seems the only logical place for them to go is the place that is also the most dangerous. Back to Hellas. The captain, however, is okay with this. There are still men on the grounds inside the colony, and the place would be a perfect place to show Afaranchi what the situation is like for the colonies right now. The episode ends with Afaranchi and Krishna watching the Earth from the ship's viewport. Afaranchi realizes that space is a lot more different than the ocean. When Krishna asks if he hates it, Afaranchi says no, that he can still feel warmth here in the darkness of the void, that even though he's so far away, he still has people he cares for, and he can sense the presence of them here. And with that, Episode 7 ends. Okay, Episode 7. No action once again, but that's about to change soon. 
the crew is heading back to Hellas, and things are going to get very intense very fast. For now, let's talk about some of the new faces we've met. Admiral Parrish. Ooh boy, this guy. I have a lot of issues with this guy. He's quite literally the definition of someone who's completely enthralled in the idea that Afarachi is a copy of Shar. The guy is much older than the others, and is obviously blinded by nostalgia for something he never was alive to experience. The guy worships this idea that Afarachi is their savior, and it's very hard to like the guy with him being so fanatical. Nonetheless, he commands an interesting ship. The Mother Metatron is an insane warship with a crap ton of weapons at its disposal. If you look at this translated diagram, this ship has a crud load of technology and weapons with it. Even though it only bolsters two catapults, the ship stores over 30 man machines in its hangar. For comparison, the Nail Argama from Gundam Unicorn had seven catapults, seven runways for mobile suits, and vehicles spread across its entire body, yet could only store up to 16 machines in its hangar, making this thing nearly twice the size and capacity of former Federation model ships. The Mother Metatron insanely also sports four, count them, four hyper mega particle cannons. Comparing once again to the Nail Argama, that ship just had only one of those, and that type of weapon nearly melted a hole straight through the side of the Palau asteroid. This ship is like a mobile fortress. Now, getting back to the characters, I'd like to briefly mention the other officer we meet, Glenn Coldill. Now, he's not super important right now, but try to keep your attention on him whenever he's in the room. This guy is gonna kinda be important a little bit later. Finally, as for Lila Saber, she's very much a simple character to follow alongside Yurian. She's not super important to the plot right now, but for the sake of getting to know her, and for the sake of the simple and obvious comparisons people will make to her, she's pretty much a character combination of Lila and Mawa from Zeta Gundam, but as well, strangely, with a little bit of resin from Shar's counterattack. Less of a love interest, but more of a sidekick for Yurian to have with him in future fights. She's very hot-headed like Resin, I find, but has the status of having a much closer connection to the villains of the story rather than like Resin was in Shar's counterattack with just being a high-tier henchman in the background. Anyways, not much to say more about Episode 7. This one really just acts as a sort of an introduction to the next stage of the coming conflict, with our heroes heading back to Hellas. By the way, that idea just screams bad plan. Speaking of bad ideas, Episode 8 begins how we would expect this sort of plan to go. As the ship enters Hellas' territory, the ship is immediately approached by six Manhunter man machines that are patrolling its perimeter. The captain orders that the ship transmit its fake clearance codes, as it's the only way they'll be able to infiltrate the colony. Luckily this works, and the ship is granted permission to the docks with the man machines continuing their sweep of the area. The crew all give a sigh of relief, and the captain tells Afarachi to go get some sleep as the ship is still quite a ways away from the colony, and it's going to be a long while before they make it to the docks. Afarachi agrees, and decides to go take a rest. While sleeping, we get to see something interesting that Afarachi has begun to experience in his dreams. He has a deep vision of Shar's former life, the sound of Shar's voice when he and Amaro fought over Lala, the fight that ended with Lala's death. This memory is actually one that we, the audience, have witnessed before. The memory that Afarachi is particularly experiencing is the same flashback from Shar's counterattack that Shar himself had when he was talking to Nanai. Afarachi's dream, however, doesn't end here, though. It ends with his memory of Everly, the moment when she called his name before they parted ways. This wakes Afarachi up, leaving him to ponder what it meant. What exactly is the significance of these memories of Lala soon, and just how they relate to him? Spoilers, 
I'll tell you right now. In simple terms, it's because the two look alike, and these memories are showing off Ranchi what exactly he should be focusing on, and in reality, these memory flashes are preparing him for the future when it comes to what he should be prepared to protect and also what to avoid when it comes to following Shar's path. This is something that Avaranchi is slowly beginning to understand. He hasn't fully realized it yet, but this is what the memories are guiding him to. Try thinking of it like the memories he's experiencing are like a cautionary tale for him to be wary of. That that's what they're doing for him. For those of you who are wondering. Anyways, let's get back into the story. When Afarachi wakes up, Krishna calls him to the bridge, and it seems they've arrived at their destination, Side 2's Hellas. Afarachi watches the colony as it's much bigger than he first imagined. He's amazed that people were able to build something so gigantic. Once inside the port, Joe takes note of the strange lack of security at the checkpoint. The place seems very lightly guarded to be the new headquarters of the Manhunters. Afarachi asks if it's a good idea for them to be here, with so few people around. The others reassure him that things would have been much worse if it was crowded. They'd actually be found quicker if they were spotted sneaking through a large herd of people. Luckily, their ship is on standby at the docks, and if things go too bad, it'll be easier to escape. It is then Avaranchi gets to see the colony's interior. This colony is much older, yet it does have mirrors, so it isn't the oldest kind in the Earth Sphere, with lush greenery surrounding the entire walls of the colony. Avaranchi himself is amazed by the colony's giant mirrors that reflect the sun's rays. Krishna says that the colony has its entire environment controlled by computers. With Avaranchi amazed as in comparison to his home island on Earth, his people could never be in real control of nature to this extent, just able to predict the outcome through the changes in the waves, the winds, and the clouds. Krishna laments that it has to be this way, that without the colony's systems operating the way that they do, the colony's population would all die and use up the oxygen within the colony's cylinder. The doors open, and Afaranchi enters Hellas with the crew, being greeted by the city and the bustle of locals. Afaranchi is amazed at the high up view, as he can see the parallel side of the city from above. Krishna says it must feel strange, and that it takes getting used to. Afaranchi agrees, and the three head out into the city. Later, as the three take a car through the city, Joe is quick to warn Afaranchi to not open his window, as they are now entering the center of Grenz, the colony's shady downtown area. The place just so happens to also have the highest level of crime in the colony. Afaranchi witnesses a fistfight break out immediately amongst the inhabitants and drivers in the lane ahead. Afaranchi is appalled by the state the place is in, it's even worse than what he witnessed in the streets of Hong Kong. Krishna says that it's like this in all the colonies. Hellas is 3 kilometers in diameter and 32 in length, yet is currently housing over 100 million people within its walls. It's completely unsustainable, and it's like this for all of the colonies in the Earth sphere. Grenz is the only place for the poor people as politicians and the rich are the only people who can afford to live outside of the area. Afaranchi's reaction is naturally that of shock, appalled that the colonies aren't the paradise he imagined they are, that this place is even worse than the state that Earth is in. Krishna then asks Afaranchi if he understands now that fighting for independence of the space noids is the only way that they can survive this. Afaranchi does, but he also laments that he now feels the burden that's been placed on his shoulders. He almost feels like it's a joke that he's been put in charge of something so impossible. Joe tells him it's all fine and to not feel bad about it. He's jumped right into this and it's only natural to be overwhelmed. All he can try to do now is to do his best. Krishna tells Afaranchi that this was where she was born and this is where she's lived throughout her youth. That it's only logical that people would believe in the idea of new types, that the idea of that possibility was and still is their one and only hope while enduring the harshness of space. Later, the three park their vehicle and the three walk along the side streets, and Joe asks Krishna about a contact they're meeting, an astrologer 
by the name of Ento Sismesia. Krishna explains that Ento is someone important and she intends to visit her while she's here, as she was the woman who raised Krishna after her father died. The three enter an apartment, with Joe heading back to bring the car around. When Krishna enter the building, they find the place is extremely dingy. When they enter the door and Krishna enters the apartment, it takes a second for Ento to make her way into the living room. Krishna asks what happened, and Ento laments that she's starting to grow blind. She looks over and manages to see the young man who's standing near the doorway. Afaranchi introduces himself, and the old woman is very intrigued by Afaranchi's name. It's a very curious and odd one, one that actually makes her excited about reading the young man's fortune. Krishna says there's no time for that, but Afaranchi says he too is kind of cheerfully excited about the idea of having his fortune read. As they sit down with the old woman at the table, to the side with a crystal ball in the middle, the woman begins to read the fortune to Afaranchi. When the woman peers into it, she's at first taken aback by what she sees. It doesn't seem that the young man has a constellation he was born under. When she asks what his birthday is, Afaranchi says that he was told it was on August 10th, but when the woman finds it, she finds it a little odd as the constellation is buried beneath such a thick fog, as if he never had a birthday at all. Wink wink. When Afaranchi asks what his fortune is then, the woman says Afaranchi doesn't need to worry about his fate. It seems he's already walking the right path. That he seems to be walking with the right kind of guidance from the light he follows. Before the two can make sense of this though, they hear Joe outside as he seems to have run into some trouble. Krishna goes outside to help him, leaving Afaranchi with the fortune teller. Outside, it seems Joe has accidentally gotten the attention of some not so good people. It seems some bikers are trying to pick a fight with him. The leader is a man by the name of Messer Met. He and his friends are trying to pick a fight with Joe over his car saying that the man should have moved aside when he was told to. When Krishna asks if Joe is okay, Messer sees it as a challenge. Maybe he'll teach all these outsiders a lesson. But before he can do anything, Krishna recognizes him and asks what he's doing. Messer is taken aback by Krishna, with the moment soon turning to camaraderie as the man realizes Joe's Krishna's friend. The group all go out for drinks, and Messer says that Joe should have said that he was a friend of Krishna's first, as he wouldn't have given them much trouble with the gang as he did. Messer then asks what the big deal is with Afaranchi, Joe trying to remind Krishna that it wouldn't be safe to say anything as they are in a bit of a shady area. One of Messer's buddies, a girl named Ray, tries to leave, but Messer brings her back as he doesn't want to be made a fool by her exit. Krishna then asks what exactly has Messer been doing all this time. The guy is a punk, and he doesn't seem to be really looking the part of someone who was last seen looking for a job. Messer then says he's fine, and that he's been doing lots of stuff lately. The chains are simply for protection. He can easily break someone's face in if they try to mess with him. Krishna then realizes that this is the kind of work he's been getting himself involved in. Gang stuff. The man laughs, but is soon interrupted by Afaranchi, who asks about him, wondering how things have been for him lately while living in the colony, with the Manhunter takeover, as everything has changed since then. Messer admits that nothing really has changed, and Grenz is still the same old shantytown that it's always been, and the Manhunters have just been a minor nuisance. He then asks if the two are with Metatron, their own silence giving it away. The man laughs and chuckles at the thought of Krishna, who was known to be a crybaby as a child, is now fighting for the resistance. Joe says not to make fun of her, and Afaranchi agrees. Messer then asks if being a member of Metatron is all that great, and Afaranchi says that it doesn't matter if it is or not, but that he can't go around making fun of other people's choices. Messer then gets furious from those words, the man punching Afaranchi to the floor and knocking a table as Messer yells at him for mouthing off to him. But Afaranchi, in response, says that if Messer has that kind of attitude in him, then why is he so short-sighted and not using his strength to change things for himself? Before Messer can hit him again, 
Krishna steps in between the two and shields Afaranchi from the brute, with Krishna stating that Afaranchi is far too valuable. Messer in return yells at her, wondering if she's just sticking up for her boyfriend, but she slaps him across the face, bothered by his snide remarks and asking why his head always goes towards such lowbrow things. Before he can respond, the group hears sirens from outside begin to grow closer. The Manhunters have been alerted to the scene. As the group disperses, Krishna is quick to point out that Afaranchi isn't with them. It seems the Manhunters are deploying tear gas into the streets, and the clouds are getting too thick for them. Afaranchi himself makes it out of the smoke to an alley, wondering where his friends are. But just as he makes it out of the alley and onto the road, he's soon struck by a car that's heading through the smoke cloud. A woman steps out of the vehicle, and a man also comes out to help him. Afaranchi is saying that he can't go to the hospital and that he needs to make it to the port. When he passes out, Afaranchi is taken into the custody of those who hit him. That being Captain Dargle and Lieutenant Marissa. Episode 8. Now, once again, not much action, but man, this isn't good. Dargle just stumbled across Afaranchi, and him getting captured is not good at all. We've also been introduced to some other new faces, those being Messer and Ray. Now, for Ray, I didn't really cover her much in my uh, my breakdown. I didn't mention her name at all, um, but she is one of the members of Messer's little gang. She doesn't say a lot, but the girl is a very tightly guarded person. We'll see more of her open up as the story goes forward. As for Messer himself, though, the guy is actually one of the best characters in the story, being very much a similar character to that of Bicha from Double Zeta. He goes through quite the redemption arc in Gaia Gear. It's cool to see this guy grow up. Now, as for the fortune teller, Ento's words may not seem like much from the start, but if you're a hardcore fan who knows the inner workings of Shar Azenable, you'll notice right away to what she's referring to when it comes to Avaranchi having a guiding light, that being Everly and his desire to make it back home in the end. Now, as for the rest of the episode, it's really meant to set up the grounds for our next major event in the story, that being Avaranchi's first encounter with B. John Dargle. Now, I like the joke that Yurian is Afaranchi's rival in the story, and that is true, but the real arch enemy of Afaranchi in this story is very much Dargle. Much like how Shirako and Jared were rivals for Camille. Once again, Zeta Gundam is probably the biggest influence on Gaia Gear when it comes to the characters. I mean, just look at Wong Lo and Lila Saber. Afaranchi is very much like Camille in many ways, but lacks the angst that Camille is notorious for. Honestly, at times, to me he feels like Shar Aznable had his soul remolded in the image of a character like Benazir Lynx or Yuta Kasim, the two most altruistic protagonists in all of the UC timeline. Now, personally, from the standpoint of a fan who's only been a hardcore Gundam fan for about a decade, with Victory Gundam being the entry that takes place chronologically before this thing, I find that this story is a much better one to end the timeline on, having a character like Afaranchi being the last character to hold the role of protagonist just feels the most poetic thing for the UC as a story giving us a character who carries the weight of the original Gundam story into this new era, as well as being a character whose altruism shines like those two characters who I mentioned who came a century prior, the three being proper examples of what the new types are and what they should be striving to become. And with the timeline ending with a Shar clone, it's all the more symbolic of Shar's importance as a character within the Gundam narrative. Once again, not a lot of action in these first two episodes of this arc, but that's going to change starting now. With that in mind, we're going to have to wait until the next episode to see what happens next. 
But don't worry, as these episodes will be rolling out much quicker, as I have already written the scripts for each of them. Anyways, I'm sorry that this ending may feel a bit abrupt, but don't worry, the next part will be out sooner than later. Anyways guys, I will see you guys later. This is Gaia Gaius, signing out. Bye!